A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here ends the reading. Let us truly hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and let our hearts be open to these words. We receive your word with greatness. Amen. This past week, many of you received an email notice about my upcoming personal and professional transition. For those of you who do not receive church news via email, I'm really sorry we couldn't get a mailer out in time given the holidays but there is a copy for you to pick up in the various places you can pick news up. And so this news is I have recently accepted a full-time position with the Alzheimer's Association as a helpline care consultant. Now I'm really excited about this position. I'm excited about the opportunity to return to clinical social work, as well as prepare myself for a future maybe of bivocational ministry, being a pastor and a clinical social worker. And throughout my father's journey with dementia, I would always say this thing is not redeemable. There's nothing redemptive about it. But I guess I hope that something that I have learned in that time could be helpful to others as I care for them and their families. So given that my first day of this job is December 11th, my last Wednesday night with our youth is December 6th, and my last Sunday in Roseville worship is December 17th. Pastor Brian Vance Morey, our SPRC, our Staff Parish Relations Committee Chair, and I have met to talk about how to cover the staffing gaps, and we hope to move on that fairly quickly. So I know that this decision in my departure may seem abrupt, Uh, and perhaps a lot of you have questions about why. And for the past six months, I honestly, church, have struggled to know how to share with you that I have been in process, a discernment process about my vocation and career, and I'm really sorry if my choice to not share about that with you causes any harm or feelings of betrayal. I also want to be very clear, I'm not being pushed out of my position by anybody, by any of you or Pastor Brian or the bishop or the district superintendent. This is a decision of my will. I also don't want my departure to indicate any kind of disapproval of the changes that have been happening at Centennial. I am making this decision fully knowing and believing that the changes here are really good and preparing us for what is to come in our future. And it's also my hope and trust that whatever leadership configuration chosen to replace me will be even better suited for what you all need during such a time as this. I'm also hoping to continue on with my ordination through extension ministry, um, but we'll see if that works out in a few days. So friends, it's been a privilege to serve alongside of you all of these two and a half years You've given me many opportunities that I've been grateful for. And I hope that you receive this news not with despair, but remembering that our ancient story of faith is one of life after death, of goodness after change, and of God's new and hope-filled mercy each morning. I hope that you, along with me, feel God's commitment to helping you live an energized and spirit-filled life. So, before I officially begin my sermon, will you please pray with me? O holy God, in your scriptures we see that you have been creating a story of love from the very beginning to now. 
And in the midst of you showing us your love with increasing lavishness, you have also constantly called your people to change. Bless you. From Abraham, Moses, and David, to Paul, and Lydia, and Timothy, and everyone in between and after, following you has meant change of location, hopes, expectations, professions, career character traits, relationships, and more. And God, here you are yet again calling us to change in this staffing way and in all the small ways in our lives. God, help us continue to see change as more of a friend and less an enemy. And please bless all of us as we celebrate new beginnings Help us grieve and say goodbye in ways that will help us become more full and hope-filled people, grateful for this life and your love. God, thanks for being with us always, every step of the way. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I think it's maybe God's sense of humor that the last thing I am to preach about in your midst, at least in this season of life, is something I am frankly terrible at and I don't really like to do all that much and I feel very justified about, which I'll talk about. Uh, This is very unfortunate to be bad at gratitude and resistant to the practice of gratitude because it is a practice that transcends all human religions It's part of our human spirituality, and there has been a growing body of research speaking to its emotional benefits and its ways that it helps us connect better with one another. And not only that, but in our Christian tradition, in our sacred text, we heard Paul this morning tell the first Thessalonians, and thus us, give thanks in all circumstances. And though there are only three explicit times in the Gospels when Jesus gives thanks, when I read that I was like, oh yeah, Jesus doesn't give thanks that much, that's okay. It's actually recorded that he gives thanks almost every single time he eats a meal. So even with all that great and compelling evidence on the end of the day of Thanksgiving, I still find in myself two pretty big barriers around regularly giving thanks and the whole notion of it in our Christian tradition. And maybe some of you share these, maybe not, maybe I'm the most heretical of all of you, Um, but I thought that we could puzzle them out together and maybe align ourselves a bit more closely to Paul and Jesus. So my first barrier is about this giving thanks in all circumstances. And my biggest beef here is about giving thanks in painful circumstances. I, as a pastor and as a person, have witnessed this exhortation to give thanks in all circumstances sometimes compels Christians to repress their true feelings and isolate themselves in their suffering by not sharing how they're really doing. Because we're supposed to be thankful, even though this sucks. And repression and isolation are never very helpful emotional responses, and they often make our suffering worse. Being alone in our suffering only intensifies it. And if we repress our pain, we might be able to ignore it now, but it always, let me tell you folks, always comes back for us to deal with. And maybe it's just me, but sometimes I feel like if I can find something I'm grateful for in the midst of something painful, it seems like that painful thing is justified for happening. Like, because it didn't destroy me entirely, it's okay that it happens. That said, as I've been thinking this through, I wonder if the practice of gratitude in the midst of painful situations can be healthy and effective if we hold two very different realities together with the same and equal weight. I wonder if we fully acknowledge and honor how painful certain things can be, and while we do that, we practice things that build our resilience. 
Now, resilience, according to the American Psychological Association, is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, workplace and financial stressors. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. And what this definition is, I think, clear about is that building our resilience does not mean avoiding pain or not feeling it. But instead, I think it means being able to be honest about the pain, to get through it, and to integrate it into our life's story. And I think that practicing gratitude in the midst of our experience of pain and difficulty can be a way we build our resilience. We are better able to bounce back. Again, gratitude isn't used to avoid pain. It's sort of like a lifesaver flotation being thrown out to us when we're lost at sea. Obviously, we're still not in great shape. I mean, we're lost at sea. But at least we have something to help us take a few breaths, save a bit of energy, and regain perspective so we can figure out how to get ourselves out of this mess. And so I think what Jesus was doing, creative interpretation, is that giving thanks before meals was building his resilience preemptively. He would need it. And also for us, giving thanks in the midst of painful or stressful circumstances can help us adapt and survive through them. So my other barrier about regularly giving thanks is this tension between the practice of gratitude and feeling genuinely grateful. I mean, I'm a millennial, so if I'm giving thanks, I want to feel thankful. And if I don't feel grateful while I'm expressing gratitude, then saying that I'm grateful for something really doesn't mean anything, and then it's not really all that compelling to continue to repeat. Authenticity, or being true to oneself, has become a sort of fundamental truth here in America these days. And we even have it as a part of our mission as church. And I love that. That's one of the many reasons I love this place and will miss this place. I love how it feels when someone is being authentic and you know that they're just showing up right where they are. And I love trying to be authentic because it just feels right and true and like it's the best thing I have to offer. But this week as I was studying and preparing, I, I read an article about authentic leadership in the Harvard Business Review and one statement just kind of reached out and bopped me. And it's this statement. Because going against our natural inclinations can make us feel like imposters, we tend to latch on to authenticity as an excuse for sticking with what's comfortable. We tend to latch on to authenticity as an excuse for sticking with what's comfortable. Ouch. Their point, though, is, and they go on, the only way to avoid being pigeonholed, to avoid becoming only one thing, and ultimately becoming better leaders is to do the things that a rigidly authentic sense of self would keep us from doing. So their argument is that authenticity can sometimes be a trump card or a shield that prevents us from feeling the discomfort that is inevitable with growth and newness. And it can often be used to get in the way of new habits that foster growth and creativity and, in our theological language, new life. Trying new things does not feel authentic at first. But honestly, given the fluidity of our human selves and how they develop over time, the more we can practice these new habits, the more they can and will begin to feel true and authentic. And I think this is the case for gratitude. The research says, and it sounds silly to say aloud, the more one practices gratitude, the more one actually authentically becomes a grateful person. 
So all of that said, we have fully entered into the season of the holidays. The season in which sometimes all circumstances aren't that glittery and bright. A season in which unhelpful family... Did you all... Did any of you feel like this at all this weekend? Joy. It's a season in which sometimes unhelpful family dynamics can flare, in which loneliness and grief can be intensified and our spending habits might be stressful. Which, I think sounds like a great time for all of us to intentionally begin a possibly inauthentic practice of resilience. All right? So, participation is now, it's your turn. Take a moment, really take a moment, close your eyes if that'll help, and imagine the weeks between now and New Year's Day. Maybe imagine the calendar, it's about five-ish weeks. So looking at that time... When and how can you, can we, begin an intentional practice of gratitude? And there's lots of ideas. I'll give you some. Could be a daily gratitude journal. The moment you get up, you write in it. Or right before you go to bed, you write one thing you're grateful for. Or it could be with your family. Every night at dinner, you share one thing you're grateful for that day. Or maybe it's taking a moment to pause before you go into your workplace or your school or a friend's house or church and giving thanks for that place and the people that you'll see. Maybe it's writing a note of gratitude to someone you care about every day for the next few weeks or writing five notes every Saturday or gathering a few friends and emailing one another that you're grateful about something each week. It could be intentionally taking a moment to say thank you really looking the people in the eye who serve you food or help you get dressed in the morning, thank you for what you're doing. Or it could be posting a picture of it on Facebook or Instagram weekly or daily. There's so many ways, so many simple ways that we can practice gratitude. Okay, so I, I said a bunch of stuff, so take a few moments now. What is one concrete idea about practicing gratitude that you're going to do, that we're going to do, and when are you going to do it? When you've got that in your mind, raise your hand. Or if you just want this to get over, you can raise your hand. (laughs) Got it? Concrete? Gratitude? We're going to try to do this. And if we miss a day, that's okay. We're going to try and start tomorrow to practice gratitude even if it feels, feels inauthentic, even if it's in the midst of painful circumstances. I hope that together as we regularly practice giving thanks, we can actually feel it's more authentically part of who we are. May it be so. Amen.